for inviting me and thank you for having me over. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I hope this will be less of an avant-garde, incoherent mess than my paper in 2019. But if it is, it also fits with uh, the room. So nothing actually can go wrong, even if it's terrible, you know, it's going to be. And of course, I sent the, the link to my um, Instagram page. The reason I really like it, besides the fact that I'm, uh, I guess, trying to become the next PewDiePie. And my son is called actually Felix, not because of PewDiePie, but, you know, that's his name also. Uh, it's also just because, I mean, for instance, now I'm going live on Instagram trying to see how it goes. And I'm trying to also incorporate some academic stuff into my Instagram. But that is not relevant right now. So the... Um, the title it used to be Oh Hi Gwudmunder, as uh, Andy, our, one of the listeners, knows, and I changed the name to Tearing a Text Apart, which I felt was more fitting. Uh, audience participation and authorial intent in Yosvin Saga and Tommy Wiseau's The Room. So uh, I'm Jörg Rosch, an independent scholar, and that is my Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram tagline. So um, just to kind of give everyone a sense of what exactly the room is, because I'm not sure everyone has seen it. Um, yeah, and even if they did, it's always nice to remember. I will first start with a video, not a critical scene, but a scene that's very reflective of the movie. And it's something also a bit meta about it, so I like it. So let me know if the sound, do this if the sound is working. <laughs> these characters doing here? They like to come here to do their homework. What homework? Mom, this is Michelle's boyfriend, Mike. Mike, this is my mother. It's a pleasure to meet you. Mm. Uh-huh. Oh. oh. All that chopping wore me out. Hey, Lisa. Hey, Denny. Denny, this is my mom. Mom, this is Denny. How many people come in and out of this apartment every day? This is worse than Grand Central Station. I just need to borrow some sugar. Help yourself, Denny. I also need a cup of flour and half a stick of butter. Doesn't your home have a kitchen? I'll come back later. Tell me, what does Denny do? Johnny wanted to adopt Denny. It's really a tragedy how many kids out there don't have parents. When Denny turned 18, Johnny found him a little apartment here in this building and he's paying for it until he graduates from school. Johnny really loves Denny, even though he doesn't say it much. He's like a father figure to him. I told you, mom, Johnny is very caring about the people in his life. And he gave Denny his own set of keys to our place. Please don't hurt Johnny. Now, if you really don't love him, so be it, but you should tell him. Oh, uh, wait, one, one more second. Yeah. Sorry. I forgot my, oh, uh, look. <laughs> what it, what's this? <laughs> uh, that's, that's nothing. Hey. <laughs> Homework. <laughs> don't worry about it. If I were a burglar, you would be my best friend. Look, I don't want to talk about it. Okay, so <laughs> this specific scene is uh, mostly meant to illustrate oh, the absurdity of the movie. Uh, and now I will start with my paper proper. So, uh, I, yeah, sorry. And I have here a, like a list of bibliography, just so you see that I'm not the only person that thought it would be a good idea to write about the room. There's actually quite a few papers. Um, the most notables are these four uh, by James uh, McDowell and Zborowski, uh, by Richard Mc. Me <clears throat> uh, by René Middlemost, uh, Middlemost and by Dimitrios Pavlo Pavlonis. So these are these are very, very important writings that are connected to the room. And it's just like to, to illustrate to you that this is a movie that has been seriously discussed. And these are specific researches that focus on it, but there are also wider researches that look into it, uh, in, you know, kind of anecdotally. So it's been quite widely discussed. So, um, this paper will try to seriously discuss one of the most ridiculous texts in the world, Tommy Wiseau's The Room. It is best to start by showing you a short, oh, so this is a very meta moment. It is best to, to start by showing you all 
a short clip just so we're all on the same page. So now we're all on the same page. It is this article, uh, is this basically paper's contention that despite recent and not so recent dismissals of the role of the author, our image of a work's creator and our uh, creators and our belief that we can attain their original intent are critical in the modern artistic experience. So the following discussion will indeed pair the two unlikely friends, uh, Tommy Wiseau's The Room, and which is also widely considered the citizen cane of bad movies, and the 13th century Icelandic saga, Ljósvetnia saga, which has become a neglected saga, barely addressed in today's scholarship. Our illusionary ability to obtain with those intentions is contrasted with our inability to reach Ljósvetnia saga's author's intention when putting words to parchment. So, both the film and the saga, it will be shown, suffered a disconnect in their transmission from the original intent of their authors. While has invo uh, it was involved, in fact, in most of the film's process as it is uh, as its stated writer, director, producer, and the main actor, basically he plays the protagonist, the different stages of medial transmission from book to play to film, and we'll discuss this a bit more later, um, cause a natural disconnect between intention and result, made worse by Wiseau's own failure to translate his cinematic vision to the screen. In the case of Lios Vendinga Saga, the, particularly, uh, the particular nature of manuscript transmission, as well as editorial practices, cause a situation where the authorial intent of a supposed original author, author became irretrievable. So it will be shown that despite this relatively unique situation where one voice is involved in most stages of the creation process, a true understanding of Wiseau's intention is unattainable because of the nature of film production. With The Room, the audience misreads faulty transmission as intention, while with Josvenninga Saga, this faulty transmission is understood as intentional where it is not and is non-intentional where it is. So basically, people don't really know when something is intended and when something isn't. What makes the 21st century movie The Room particularly interesting to compare with that of the 13th century Ljosvenninga saga is the cult that has been established around the film and the result, uh, resulting audience participation during its, um, during its screenings. The audience shouts out slurs, corrections, and responses to the characters, filmmakers, and writing of the room, uh, sorry, and the writing of the room will be compared with the editorial practices that are employed in the Osvendinga saga editions from basically all, all along from the medieval manuscripts until the 20th century. Both will be considered forms of audience participation. So if you want me to summarize the argument going in, I will argue that editing a saga is equivalent to shouting at the screen when you're watching Rocky Horror Picture Show or The Room. So, uh, Liosvenninga Saga, what is Liosvenninga Saga? It is a member of the Islandia Sur Corpus. I hate the word, well, I don't hate the word genre. That's such a strong word. I dislike the word genre. And uh, as such, I uh, prefer the term uh, Islandia Sur Corpus, which charts the feuds between two prominent uh, North, uh, North Icelandic families. Um, you know what? The best thing I can do is if I draw you. So quickly draw a map of Iceland. Actually, I already quickly drew. This is a myth, this is a rhetorical technique. But um, okay, so here, this is, uh, can you see this? This is the area of the, well, north center, northeast of Iceland. And here is uh, modern day Akureyri. So see, I'm zooming out. Whee! Here, this is the area of modern day Akureyri. There's like this valley here. So Gvudman and Ricky lived at the end of this valley. And the mother and the Ljosvetningar, the people of Ljosavat, lived somewhere around here, near uh, if you know where Mivat is. Let's put a big a blue there. So you know I'm talking about a lake. Oh, that's way too much blue. Ah, whatever. Here. It's blue, it's a lake. So basically, the interaction is between the people in Modrovetling, um, in Modrovetlir, which is uh, matter field. The translation um, between the people in Ljosavat, which are near Mivat. So Ljosavat is this really beautiful kind of la lake that is 
overshadowed by Miva. Uh, it's also near, if you know Godafoss, if you've been to Iceland. I'm not going to provide. I am, I am working as a tour guide these days, so I could provide you with a uh, extensive uh, survey of Iceland, but uh, I'm not being paid for this, so I won't. <laughs> uh, so I will continue. Between the late, uh, so basically it charts these, um, it charts the feud between the late 10th up to the mid 11th century. One thing I do want to note that I haven't written in my text actually, is that um, this feud is actually quite famous, most notably if you read Nial Saga, I'm assuming 99.9 uh, .9 of the participants here read it. And you will know that the, the, the fight between uh, Gvildmundur in Riki and the sons of Thorgir, Thorgir, Ljosvendingagodi, the guy, you know, blanket guy, wait, happy, yeah. blanket guy, yes. So blanket guy, uh, the guy who kind of covers himself with fur and says like, oh, I will decide that Iceland will be pagan or Christian or whatever. And then he's bribed. So of course he decides for Christian. Um, so that's also charted in the saga itself, uh, in Njal saga itself, not just Ljosvendinga saga. And if you remember Thorkel Haukur, the son of, uh, of Thorger, he has this fight with Skarpedi in quite an awesome kind of confrontation. So the saga's fo focus is on the Modrovetlingur, Kvudmundur and Riki, Eyjolfsson, and his son Eyjolfur, who takes over district leadership after his dad's passing, his father's passing. Despite this focus, this saga seems very biased towards the Ljosvendingar, so the people from, you know, from the lake and not from the people from uh, matter fields. And Gwilmund and Riki is especially derided, this saga and other characters often targeting his masculinity as something to, ri to ridicule. So uh, I have here a short summary of the saga, but I feel like it's not entirely irrelevant now, so I'm not gonna go into it. But of course, if anyone has questions about the content of the saga, there is an entire chapter of my PhD about that, and I love talking about every moment in that saga. So please do ask me, and I will oblige. So um, this is the manuscript slide. <laughs> Basically, the Osvenia saga is currently preserved in two medieval manuscripts, AM 561 Quarto, which is dated to sometime between the end of the 14th and the beginning of the 15th century, so around the plague, and AM 162 C Folio, which is dated to circa 12, uh, 1420 to 1450. What's interesting is that these two manuscripts represent two, um, uh, two significantly differing versions uh, of the saga. AM 561 Corto uh, is commonly referred to as the A redaction and AM uh, 162 C folio and it's around, uh, well, I wrote more than 30 paper manuscripts, but actually it's around 50. So it's 50 paper manuscripts. Um, they represent the C redaction or C version. So, in order to illustrate this, uh, I kind of did like this kind of um, slide here that to basically show you what I'm talking about when I'm saying that deferring and similar. So you see the blue parts in these two in this slide. So that's chapter one to four and 19 to 21 circa. Um, they are identical. And when I say identical, it's not, of course, it's manuscripts, so it's not identical, but it's rather close to each other uh, in wording. The differences have been downplayed, and I discovered that during my PhD, but still, they, you can still say that this is, um, these are the same saga. Um, but then what happens is, and now you see the yellow parts in the bottom in C version, there are fighted. So I, I, I feel like in this crowd, I don't need to explain what fighted are, but just short episodes. There's short episodes that basically um, are incorporated into the story and have a function in the story. Then there's chapters 13 to 18, which are different between the A redaction and the C redaction. Then again, like I said, there's a similar 19 to 21. And then um, colloquial analysis of this, um, of this saga shows that the A version never had the uh, chapters 22 to 32, and C redaction did have chapters 22 to 32. And these chapters are the story of Eyjolfur, not of Gudmundur. Gudmundur dies at the end of chapter 21. He dies a shameful death, of course, as the saga likes to shame him. So um, one important note that keep in your mind, I'm not sure if you'll remember, but uh, not to like, it's just because I know it's a lot of information, a lot of philological information. It's not that you, you guys are obviously 
all educated in the sagas, so you know what I'm talking about. But okay, so chapter 32 is a story about the killing of Thorgeir in Fosbreida saga, and it ends abruptly and is added out of its chronological logic. So actually in my, okay, I, I keep saying my PhD, and I mean, you know, it's not a brag when it's at all academics, but in my, uh, because I work as a tour guide, when I say my PhD, I feel like I'm bragging, but of course you all have, a lot of you guys have PhDs. Um, but in my PhD, I often discuss the fact that there's a lot of chronological discrepancies between different parts. There's a lot of parts in Lyosvindinga saga, especially in this C redaction part in chapters 22 to 32, where characters come that shouldn't be alive. Characters come that should be basically dead. They, they, they shouldn't be there, but yet they're there. Uh, one example is Thorkel Geitison, uh, who you might know from uh, Votfirdinga saga, and he should be long dead by then. Um, there's also a physician um, who appears uh, in the Osvendinga saga that also should be long dead from Votfirdinga saga as well. Um, there's a Finbogi, uh, Finbogi from Finboga saga and his son appears. He shouldn't be alive. A lot of characters that shouldn't be alive appear. So the fact that chapter 32 has a story that isn't in its chronological place is not entirely as odd as it might seem. It's like extracting it from the saga, as I will show Bjorn Sigfusson has done, is not necessarily intuitive because the saga in general likes to displace characters and people out of their time. So it's a general trend of the saga. So therefore, doing it in the last chapter isn't that unique. Okay, so uh, compared to the attention uh, awarded to its more famous sisters, such as Gisla Saga Sursunar, um, Eir Saga Skatlagrim Sonar Son, uh, Skatlagrim Sonar, Erviga Saga, or Laxdaila Saga, little research nowadays is dedicated to Lyosvendinga Saga, especially as, the, as a main case study. Beyond the occasional brief mention or even rarer paragraph length discussion, I believe Chris Callow actually discusses recently, he has a book, he has like a book length debate of, uh, not sorry, not book length, a chapter length debate of uh, Gunda Niki at any rate. But still, it is more accept exception rather than the rule. This is no Nyao Saga. So this was not always the case. Uh, Gvudnadur Thorlaxon's 1880 edition of Lyosvendinga Saga sparked an interest in the saga well into the mid 20th century when Bjorn Sigfusson's quarrelsome Islands Fortnite edition of the saga was released and it was more, most fittingly published in the middle of the Second World War. Besides Halvard Magaroy's 1957 monograph uh, and then Anderson and Miller's 1989 translation of the saga that has a very extensive introduction, uh, that, built, that was actually the last book length research dedicated to it. There have been PhDs, for example, you know, some of the attendants here have written PhDs about this, but um, generally, um, uh, sorry, brain, uh, brain stopped working. Yes, but generally there isn't a book published. So for instance, I haven't published my PhD. So, you know, okay. So the reason research and interest in the sagas, uh, in this saga has waned in the last decades is tied to the very reason why this interest was sparked in the first place, the saga's complex transmission. So just, yeah. So yeah, um, I don't know if I should explain this one, but uh, perhaps I... Perhaps I should. Okay, so I'll do this very quickly. And I'm sorry, I'm so sorry if I'm really over time. And, uh, you know, feel free to leave and, you know, escape me if you want. I will not be offended. I know people have uh, family and friends and things to see in the world. Okay, so basically, um, this um, this is a basically the comic that actually started my comic. Uh, again, at Real Mundi Reiki. Highly recommended. The best fun you'll have in your lives. And uh, basically, this comic... What uh, basically I'm kind of telling a love story between Grunud and Ricky and Rindit, this kind of fellow that is his spy, and he kind of uses him to kill one of the sons of Thorger, right? Blanket guy. So one of his sons, he kills him and he uses Rindit as kind of a spy for that situation. And when you tell the story, you can actually, so the, the reason I, I did this here, the slide, and I'm not going to go too much into it, but you can tell the story in a very interesting way that kind of combines um, that combines both versions. So basically 
both versions give their own set of information about this that is sometimes different, sometimes contradictory. And by telling it a certain way, you're basically also kind of creating a new story, much like the additions do when they like pick and choose and combine things together. I, I, I hope that makes sense. Um, okay. So, but the reason, so the reason that research, oh, sorry, yeah. So the existence of two redactions created a disagreement over which of them was closer to a supposed original. The free prose scholars, our, our friends, argued for an oral background that accounted for the differences between the saga's two significantly different accounts, while the book prose scholars, also our friends, argued that these differences stem from a literary relationship between the redactions. I need to take, is my lighting okay? Because it's getting kind of dark here in Iceland. You know, it's sunset in Iceland. Okay. Furthermore, in 1885, Swedish poet Albert Ulrich Böhr suggested that it's B A, yeah, A O uh, T H, suggested that Ljosvindinga saga is the clearest case where one can detect the composition of the sagas as a group of thaitir, again, short episodes put together, but not seamlessly. Despite Andres Heusler's takedown of Bot's theories, all further discussions of the so-called thaitir was uh, of these as interpolated texts. So again, to clarify, there's uh, three or four texts that don't belong in the saga. Texts that focus on the North Let's do this again. Da, da, da. Okay, so most of the Osvendinga saga takes place here, right? Between fight between these guys. But here, there are people that come from here. You know, the people of Votfirdinga saga, right? The people of Votfirdinga saga have interactions with Vimundinrik, a lot of the characters there. And um, Basically, what Grunderniki is trying to do is to assert his power over the Northeast, but uh, people like Bjarni Brodhelgason and Thorkel Geitison don't let him. So he retreats back to um, he retreats back to his area and takes over that his neck of his own neck of the woods. So the story of his attempted takeover of the area of saga, and of course I'm or Vopnafjordr. And of course, this is kind of, um, I'm exaggerating. He tries to expand his influence. The story of this is um, in many ways, they're always treated as, uh, as interpolations, as if they don't belong, okay? Um, so, yeah. So let's get back to this. Um, so these Thaiti, right? They're, told, they're, they're described as if they don't belong, even though, there's different arguments about how they were written. So Theodore Anderson, always uh, always there to rescue, he offered one of the few interpretations of the Thaitir as inherent to the text, and yet he, um, he still framed it as episodic. And while I think it's not necessarily episodic, it just makes sense in the overall message of the saga. So um, nevertheless, Anderson remains in the minority. And here is the most recent uh, description of the saga that I've seen to the general audience. Uh, Ellert B. Ma Ellert, Ellert, Ellert B. Magnusson um, described Ljosvendinga saga in his uh, quotes and passages from the Icelandic sagas. So this is kind of like meant for a, a general audience. So he wrote, the saga of the people of Yosavat was written late in 13th century and takes place around the Eyfjordur district. North Iceland from 1990-1060. Until now, that's fine, right? It's just what I said, isn't it? Uh, dealing with the common theme of regional feuds and disputes, the saga contains a number of memorable scenes, characters, and dialogues. Spot on. The saga contains three independent tales. Ah, why? Why do you have to say this? Short accounts of Icelanders. The tale of Surli, Brod Helgeson. Also, remember Brod Helgi from... Um, and I'm sorry if my style is a bit weird. It's because I'm a tour guide now and I'm kind of used to talking to a general audience in a very weird way. So I'm sorry. Uh, the tale of Ofegur and the tale of Vudubrandur, which were later added to the saga. As a whole, the saga itself appears more as a collection of a number of independent oral tales than a fully constructed saga. I highly disagree with this. It makes me so angry. 
Together, the issues of contested origins and textual interpolations made the saga somewhat impenetrable for the scholar wishing to research the Eastern Gesugit corpus, as well as a general re reader who has to grapple with complex and to some uninteresting, though I can't imagine why someone would find this uninteresting, I'm only like 70% joking, um, philological debates when approaching this text. And when the hullabaloo concerning the saga origin, you know, the book praise, uh, book praise, book prose, free prose debate, when that subsided, so did the interest in the Osvet saga. So if the Osvet saga is seen as impenetrable, the room's very claim to frame, uh, to frame? The room's very claim to fame is the audience's belief that it offers them unmediated access to its author's intentions, or let's say psyche. The Room is, according to the consensus, a terribly made film by a terrible filmmaker who envisioned he was making a masterpiece. So we can compare this to Don Quixote. The plot of the movie is quite simple. Johnny, a well-to-do San Francisco banker who is about to get a promotion, is betrayed by her, his fiance, and she's never called fiance in the film. She's called his future wife. So he's betrayed by his future wife, Lisa, and his best friend, Mark, who uh, start an affair. The climax of the film has Johnny reveal his knowledge of the affair during his birthday party and subsequently decide to end his life. A notorious scene that takes place on the rooftop of the apartment building where Johnny, Mark, Lisa, and the character Denny, who we will discuss later, live, could help to illustrate the film's absurdities. So this scene comes after um, a relatively, uh, after a scene that was relatively suspenseful, uh, where a drug de dealer, <laughs> a drug dealer holds a character at gunpoint, and this is never talked about again in the film. So basically, there's a there's an action scene with someone with a gun. Nobody ever mentions it again. Uh, and after this, Lisa and Mark have a telephone conversation where she proclaims her love and desire towards him, with Mark responding quite coldly to her overtures of emotion. There is therefore an immediate dis uh, discontinuity when the following scene starts with uh, Johnny being distressed, as we'll see, over an accusation of domestic violence. This reaction to what he claims are false accusations comes out of literally nowhere since any hint of domestic violence was only first voiced in a private conversation between Lisa and her mother a few scenes prior before he started recording them. That's important to know. Johnny should not have even been aware of these allegations at this point. So instead of talking, let's show. But I still have feelings for you. You just don't care. I do care. I have to go now. I'll see you later, darling. Don't oh, sorry. call me that. Okay, bye. I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Oh, hey, Johnny. What's up? I have a problem with Lisa. She said that I hit her. <sighs> what? Well, did you? No, it's not true. Don't even ask. What's new with you? Well, I'm just sitting up here thinking, you know? I got a question for you. Yeah. You think girls like to cheat like guys do? What makes you say that? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just... I'm just thinking. I don't have to worry about that because Lisa is loyal to me. Yeah, man, you never know. People are very strange these days. I used to know a girl. She had a dozen guys. One of them found out about it, beat her up so bad she ended up in a hospital on Guerrero Street. <laughs> what a story, Mark. Yeah, you can say that again. I'm so happy I have you as my best friend and I love Lisa so much. Yeah, man. Yeah, you are very lucky. Well, maybe you should have a girl, Mark. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I have one already. I don't know yet. Well, what happened? Remember Betty? That's her name? Betty? Yeah. Yeah, we don't see each other anymore. You know, she wasn't any good in bed. She was beautiful, but we had too many arguments. That's too bad. My Lisa's great when I can get it. Oh, man, I just can't figure women out. Sometimes they're just too smart. Sometimes they're flat out stupid. Other times they're just evil. It seems to me like you're an expert, Mark. No, definitely not an expert, Johnny. What's bothering you, Mark? 
Nothing, man. Do you? Do you have some secrets? Forget it. Why don't you talk? Why? Come forget on. it, dude. Is it some secret? No, Tell forget it. I'll talk to you later. Well, whatever. Okay, so <laughs> the idiosync oh my gosh, idiosyncrasy of this dialogue is immediately apparent, I can hope, I can only hope. The explicitly misogynistic sentiments uttered by Mark were already out of place in the early 2000s when the film was made. Mark's specif spec specificity, specificity with the hospital on Guerrero Street seems awkward even without the knowledge that there is in fact no hospital in San Francisco's Guerrero Street. This is made even more disturbing by Johnny laughing in response to this harsh tale. You know, I used to know a dozen guys, uh, a dozen guys. I used to know a girl, dated a dozen guys. One of them found out about it, beat her up so bad, she ended up in Guerrero Street, in a hospital in Guerrero Street. And then he just laughs. The irony of Johnny reminding Mark that he is his best friend and that Lisa is his future wife is overdone. In addition, the moments where Johnny gives hint of a suspicion of the affair, what makes you say that? And is there some secret? Are placed at a point where the narrative, in the narrative, where no such suspicion has yet developed and remain unaddressed. So he only finds out that she's cheating on him later. These problematic textual elements are enhanced by the movie's sheer goofiness. The oddness of Johnny's movements from being devastated, uh, sorry, from his movement, from being devastated by a claim that he hit Lisa to cheerfully greeting his friend Mark, oh, hi, Mark, is amplified by Tommy Wiseau's terrible acting, which moves from beats to beat without any transition. So it just moves between beats like this, no smoothness. Uh, the green screen background, which you must have noticed or maybe haven't, but uh, it gives the scene an amateurish atmosphere. The focus of the camera is also somewhat off, creating unexpected power dynamics. So you can find on YouTube a whole video that basically analyzes um, the movements and where everyone is standing and how basically there's weird power dynamics going on in this whole scene. It's very interesting. And if anyone wants, I can send them the link. Appearing in 2003 is of, in a very limited release. The Room initially received little attention its fan base growing slowly from a cult following of select individuals that were in the know to, frequently, to frequent night screenings around the world, including Iceland. So uh, of course, this could, might echo to you uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Rocky Horror Picture Show, yes. More recently, the film has received wor uh, worldwide notoriety thanks mostly to the 2017's James Franco effort, The Disaster Artist which relates the film's uh, production and its initial reception. It's very initial reception. In nightly screenings, fans shout at the screen in various scenes um, with somewhat ready-made, sometimes ready-made and sometimes improvised responses. So uh, I do have a clip of this, yeah. So this is just an example. I'm just gonna show it quickly to show you what, kind of, what I'm talking about when I'm saying shouting, so. I did not hit her. It's not true. Oh, no, it, it's it's bullshit. Oh, no, this is not what I wanted to show at all. Oh, that's a shame. Okay, so basically, uh, I can show it later after my lecture. Uh, basically, uh, people shout. So for instance, when he says that that's not true, it's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. So people talk with him and they shout it at the screen. And then when the character Denny arrives, everyone says, oh, hi, Denny. And then when he leaves, they say, oh, bye, Denny. Very awkward. For example, so more examples of this, whenever a misogynist statement is made towards Lisa, such as her mom stating that she cannot provide for herself, it is common to shout, because you're a woman. In another scene, when um, Johnny places an awkward looking recording device, a very, very, very easy to find recording device, um, to catch Lisa's conversations with her lover and her mother, audience members hum the theme song of Mission Impossible franchise. So, you know, dum, dum, da, da, dum, dum. So basically they sing this like when they are watching the scene. The most famous feature of these screenings is the throwing of spoons whenever a stock photo of a spoon appears on screen, thus emphasizing the very little attention paid to the film's production value. The absurdity of using the stock photo with which, um, with which the frame was bought rather than planting fake family or friend photos becomes a sign of laziness involved in the film's making. So 
this is actually one thing about the film that I always found confounding. I think that's the word confounding because there's only one picture of a spoon. The other pictures are other household. It's still very weird, but there's only one picture of a spoon that I actually saw. And yet we've kind of gone into this collective collective illusion that uh, it's all spoons. It's not all spoons. There's one spoon. But of course, this movie is screened not in the best quality sometimes. So therefore, you see blurry things and you think it might be a spoon. But there's only one spoon on screen. Still very odd to use stock photos, but it kind of takes away the edge from the joke. And it's also important for the context of this talk, the fact that people have kind of convinced themselves that, uh, that what you see is a spoon, even though it's not a spoon, much, much like The Matrix. So, almost every moment of the film is full of plot holes, inconsistent acting, bad camera work, and poor production choices. So much so that the movie's flaws are obvious even to those not trained in filmmaking or film studies. As McDowell and Zborowski point out, um, bad films like The Room create a democratization of the pleasures involved in being a critic. So you don't need to spend three years in, in law school or film school, whatever, whichever you prefer, in order to uh, properly criticize The Room. Anyone can do it. It's a fun activity for everyone. You don't need to. It's like um, it's like playing D&D &D, uh, uh, without knowing all the rules and just playing, you know, oh, you just throw this one to six die and whatever happens, you win or something. So, you know, uh, both Leos Vendinga Saga and The Room leave uh, gaps that need filling. And the audience, the scribes and editors in the case of the saga, and the film goers in the case of the film, uh, fill this up by responding to it, changing the text, finishing the thoughts, uh, and finishing the thoughts. Together, they problematize the notion of authorship and intent, and raise the question of who is the author of a piece of art, the artist or the audience. Ironically, the audience becomes the author in exactly those moments where they try to create, to recreate the intent of the saga or the movie's creator. The moments that frustrate their expectations of narrative coherence and conformity to their notions of how art is supposed to work are the moments when they take the mantle of authorship and try to do a better job than the authors themselves. So, McDowell and Zborowski uh, contend that the key to enjoying the room lies in the acknowledgement of Tommy Wiseau as the film's author and his intention to make a coherent film that relates his worldview. As they point out, this focus on intentions is so important that when the room uh, script, when the script uh, supervisor, Sandy Schkler, um, argued that he directed a large portion of the film and inten intentionally played up its badness, this failed to make a lasting impression. So what they say is it seems very possible that interpretive processes, processes central to bad film appreciation are frequently not only in significant ways fundamentally traditional. So when I say fundamentally traditional, I mean um, when they say <laughs> fundamentally traditional, um, they mean basically, you know, uh, believing that there's a single author, a single intent, kind of really believing in this author perception, um, but even in interesting senses, positively romantic, relying, um, for instance, on an imagined closeness to the mental processes of flesh and blood authors. Tommy Wiseau's identity as, an, as the oblivious author of the film is critical for the audience's enjoyment and interaction with the Room franchise. If we cannot establish that the filmmaker failed to convey his intention, we cannot truly enjoy the film. So it's also important to note a distinction between the medieval notion of authorship and a modern one, as well as the difference between a modern literary author and the concept of authorship in filmmaking. So when discussing the author of a medieval text such as this, um, it, such as the Osvendinga saga, it is important to remember that it is in fact always changing. At times this refers to the actual persons, possibly from the 13th century, who wrote down the saga's two redactions based on oral traditions and their own interpretation of the material. And at times we refer to an idolized and hypothetical and thus intangible figure who would have written down a now lost original that probably never existed. In cinema, there is a multiplicity of voices involved in the process of transmission a multiplicity that the audience mitigates by considering Tommy Wiseau's multiple credit, credits as the room's screenwriter, producer, director, and, um, 
um, and main character, as well as the fact that the movie had a very small scale production, which meant that it was basically, um, uh, because of its small scale production, um, this meant that uh, there, it was very easy for Tommy to kind of control everything that was happening, basically. With those image as the room's author, at least uh, from an audience um, uh, standpoint, is important for um, is important to ascertain to the degree that the ver variety of voices involved in the filmmaking process are all but forgotten. As far as the audience is considered when watching the room, it is only with those intent that counts. So if there's no intention, how can we seek to understand a text meaning? A literary interpretation transfixed by the audience and its reaction um, to a piece of literature ignores the fact that this audience is also guided by its understanding that there is an author and that he or she or that they have um, intentions and adjusts its reactions accordingly. An audience needs the concept of an author, either single or plural, in order to read a text as a coherent piece of art where all parts put together convey a consistent idea. Without situating an author in a, particularly a particular time and space and place, much of the text's meaning is lost. So this is of course more true to modern times than to medieval times. And yet, as we develop towards li uh, modern literature, we see this more and more. It is my contention that while what attracts audiences to the room is the disconnect between its author's intention and the cinematic result, what deters scholars and general readers from the Osuniga saga is both its perceived lack of intentionality and at times mistakenly uh, identified intentionality. Why is Osuniga saga, uh, well, okay, let, let's skip this part because it's a bit less um, important and we're running out of time. Yeah, okay, so I argue that the key to understanding the Osvendinga saga is its manuscript transmission, um, or just generally also to understanding both issues. In the case of the Osvendinga saga, it's in the intermedia movement from oral tales, an oral text basically, to manuscript and eventually to a printed edition. In the case of The Room, the fact that Wizzo himself took a key position in the entire process of transmission means that the end result should pr pr uh, present us with a piece that is coherent and accords with his uh, authorial intentions. However, as will be shown, the process of transmission from original script to, lo to film loses much in the translation as is wont to happen in a multi-authored process that involves a intermedia adaptation. So, um, yeah. This is, uh, I'm, I'm, I know I'm already over time, so I'm kind of curious what I should, it's fine, yeah? Okay, so like I said, if anyone wants to leave, I will not be offended. I'm, yes, so it's, it's perfectly fine, and you, you, know, you, can, uh, you can update yourself uh, on the uh, other means to see what, uh, what I said. So I will continue talking, and again, I won't be offended if someone leaves, because this is, this, this is long. I'm going to open also the light here. Iceland gets dark very easily. Okay, so as mentioned above, much of the early discussions of <laughs> on the Islandinga saga in general and of Ljosvendinga saga in particular revolved around the issue of orality versus literary sources for these texts. While the debate has reached a stalemate in recent years, Research into the oral origins of the Isaninga Sugar has much developed, especially due to Carol Clover's advancement of a comparative approach. One productive theory developed by Slavica Rankovic is that of the distributed author. This concept emphasizes that the Isaninga Sugar, the sagas of the Icelanders, um, that we have before us are narratives arrested in their development. So I like this quote because it mentions arrested development, but narratives arrested in their development, capturing a specific moment of an oral tradition, which every performance would have changed and developed. What she means by this, of course, is that any, um, any writing down of a saga captures a very, very specific um, version of this tale. And if you had someone else tell you the tale, you'd have a different version of it. So when you write it down, of course, of course, also when you're writing it down, you're influencing it yourself. But when you're writing it down, you're taking from the version that the person is telling you. So some people do it more like, you know, they composite, but some people just write down, right? So this is also very interesting. Um, many moments of Ljosvendinga saga could be seen as a result of the movement from oral to written media, as well as the changes that naturally take place during the manuscript transmission. 
In the opening chapters of the saga, Grudmundur Nriki, who is only later, who only later becomes the main character, enters the Osvendinga saga with no introduction, and other characters do that as well. This, among other reasons, caused Eriksen, Adolfina Eriksen, the scholar that wrote the first monograph about the Osvendinga saga, uh, this caused her to suggest that the opening chapters one to four were a deficient abbreviation of a no longer extant narrative. In another case, in the Sagas A redaction, the prominent nor uh, northeastern medieval Icelander, Thorkel Geitlison, the guy I mentioned from uh, Vopferdinga saga from Vopnafjordr in the northeast of Iceland. So he appears abruptly in an effort to settle matters between Gudmund and Riki and his rival, Thorir Helgason. This kind of abruptness encouraged Anderson, Theodore Anderson, to declare the A redactor an abridger. Finally, the much discussed Thaitir, the short episodes, have caused the impression that these texts were clumsily incorporated into the saga's C redaction, and that removing them would not affect the saga plot whatsoever, which is ridiculous. So, Gvudmundur Inriki's abrupt entry into the saga could be easily accounted for when one considers that this is one of the best known uh, late 10th and early 11th century Icelanders, a follower of Haukon Jarl, uh, Jarl Hakon and, Oliver, and King Oliver Helgi. His presence in several Islandic Sugar is so far reaching that Gisli Sigurdsson actually managed to reconstruct the whole guy's life based on his appearances. Utilizing the concept of the imminent saga, which supposes that medieval Icelanders would have had a rep repository of tales about certain individuals in their heads. They could conjure, conjure up these ver various stories in different tellings and different contexts. Even without this specific oral storytelling mechanic, it is clear that some individuals, Snorri Godi, Grehtir, Ausmundarson, if you have to know, uh, Ausgrimur, Etli da Grimson, or Thorstein Inkviti, for example, needed no introduction in the Islandic Sugur, and from his many appearances in the corpus, it is quite safe to assume that Gvudmundur Enrique was one of these. But it is actually ironic that when Gisli Sigurdsson himself discusses Thorkel Geitison and his appearance in the A redaction, so he, like I said, he appears kind of very, very briefly out of nowhere in the part that is a summary that was basically scraped away in the manuscript. The whole page was kind of missing um, and someone managed to kind of read it and just wrote over what is now lost or using UV light and stuff, you can still kind of recreate it, but long story. Um, so they kind of uh, were looking at this text and uh, rewriting what happened and the calculation Gvud, uh, Gvud, in, uh, in, in Artnastoptan, he calculated that out of 1,200 1, words, there's only something like 210 words that are actually preserved. So obviously these 2,010 words do not reflect these 1,200 wo uh, words. And in them, there is this appearance of Thorkel Geitison, and it's just one very short half sentence about him. But when Gisli discusses this, the, uh, it reveals the general problem that uh, stems from the state of the text. Despite him acknowledging the fragmentary na nature of the only extant medieval A redaction manuscript, 561 Quarto, uh, there's also a post medieval one um, written by Gvud Brander uh, Vigfusson. So he nevertheless treats Thorkelt's abrupt appearance as a feature of the text rather than a bug. So he says, um, a text could apparently be trusted to know who Thorkel Geitison was and could rely on the audience to work out for themselves how Thorkelt um, came to be involved in the, in the affairs of Gudmundariki and Einar Thverangur. So this statement does not acknowledge that the 210 words extant in, uh, in this page in which Thorkel Gettison appears are, an, are just an abridgment. Thus, while Gisli's statement can very well be true in regards to the post-medieval, uh, well, it's called, it's uh, the leaf uh, 37V, the page. Um, so while uh, it might be true to this abridger, post-medieval abridger, there is a high possibility that it does not reflect Yosvendinga Saga's no longer extant narrative and how it would have introduced this character's involvement in the scene. Even if he was recreating only the 400 words 
of um, that were in uh, the page that was now erased, he still only wrote 210. I'm assuming it's a he, but he still only wrote 210 pages, uh, words and not 400. So he still condensed what was on the page that he might have been able to see. With their attempt at creating definitive texts for use in scholarship and the general public, editors of normalized saga texts make, uh, make choices that influence the way a certain saga is perceived. So Emily Lethbridge has shown uh, for the case of Gisla Saga, how an editor's choice to prioritize a certain redaction over another, as well as stylistic editorial choices of prioritizing different readings when the base text does not match the editor's expectations, can skew our understanding of a saga. The same is true for Liosvinga Saga. So um, Gvudmundur, sorry, this is, this, yeah, okay. So this is Gvudmundur Torlakson's edition from uh, 1880. And it's meant for the general public, which is very weird when you look at all these footnotes. And it was the first critical edition of the saga since Thorgeir Gvudmundsson um, and Thorstein Helgeson's 80, uh, 1830 edition that was based mostly on a single post-medieval manuscript. So despite Gvudmundur's edition being quite a reliable one, I really love it, uh, in that it marks most of the significant manuscript variants, this edition has been criticized for its creating of a composite text where he combines the A redaction and C redaction manuscripts kind of together, as well as providing chapter headings that influence readers into thinking of the saga as having parts. So indeed, A redaction does have sometimes um, kind of titles, but C redaction does not, usually. Depends on the uh, uh, manuscript, of course. Beyond Sigfusson's uh, Islands Fonry tradition, however, which is uh, much more interesting in, in the sense of manipulation, it prioritizes the A redaction over the C redaction. So you see here, there's the big part and there's the small part. The big part, the, the, the bigger letters, that is the A redaction. The smaller letters are the C redaction. In the variant chapters, um, 13 to 18, the A redaction is printed, like I said, large letters and C redaction below in a smaller font. Once the story breaks off in the A redaction, in the manuscript's final lacuna, we have no way of knowing what followed or if anything followed at all. Therefore, this is quite the manipulation what he does here. This is infuriating from a philological standpoint. You see this uh, little footnote here? You see Gehktil um, here in the bottom. This is the only indication that we have that AM 561 Quarto ends because when you look at the when you look at the text, if you don't notice or if you don't really concentrate, so you believe that just the saga just continues. But in fact, AM five six one quarto, the A redaction ends. This is the last of the text. There's no scratched out pages that we can find. This is the end, my friend. Um, yeah. Okay. So once the story breaks off, we have no way of knowing what followed or if anything followed at all. Therefore, when he keeps the large letters after the break he makes it seem like the A redaction's inclusion of chapters 22 to 31 was a fact. So basically, he, he makes it appear as if Eyrvur, the story of Eyrvur, is a part, integral part of the A redaction of the text when it actually never appeared in the only manuscript, only medieval manuscript of the A redaction. As mentioned, Bjorn Sigfusson also removes Surla Thauter, Ofig's Thauter, and uh, Wudebrand's Thauter from the main body of the saga and presents them separately. So uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about this for a second. Um, the final fragmentary Thoran's Thauter Ofsa is also removed and placed after the saga in the edition with only an unnumbered footnote. He doesn't even give it a number uh, that indicates that there is any connection at all with the Oswendinga saga. So as you see here, basically these, he, this isn't a part of the saga. He basically takes them out. He takes Surla Thauter, Ofeg Thauter, Fudelbrand Thauter, and Thoran Thauter. He takes them out, but he keeps their counting in the brackets. That's the counting for the C redaction. And in the other counting, basically the, he doesn't even count them as a part of A redaction, which and that actually decision makes sense. But basically he removes them, but still includes them in the count of the C redaction story. That is a very confusing choice. But also, I think the most infuriating thing is that he takes out Thoran and Stauter, barely mentions that, you see, it doesn't have any indication in the apparatus that um, 
that is a part of the Yosef Saga. You see, these at least have Yosef et Saga, kind of as abbreviated, written there. There's no indication here that this is a part of that saga. And it is a part of that saga. It talk, talks about Eulver. It's a you know, nice story of how he's kind of asserting power in his district. It's relevant, even if it's kind of out of chronological order. So, um, yes. So, uh, Gudnur Thorlaxon's edition gives the reader the impression that the text is a patchwork of sorts, an assortment of stories put together. Bjorn Sigfusson's edition gives a similar impression for the saga's C redaction, that the uh, saga's fighter, short stories, were added unnecessarily by the redactor. In addition, he minimizes the breaks in the A redaction, thus not properly reflecting how damaged and lacking the transmission of this version of the text actually is. All these factors of inter and intra media transmission and adaptation then caused a situation where a hypothetical author's intentionality was unattainable. The debate around which redaction of the saga took precedence reached an obvious stalemate and as such a paralysis when it came to theorizing on what was actually meant by the supposed author. How can you tell what was meant by an original text author when you cannot even agree what an original text is? Like which of these two versions is original? In addition, both redactions of the saga were misrepresented. The C redactions Thaitir's importance within this text logic was underplayed, as was the significantly different scope of the A redaction, which ended in Vudmud and Nikki's death, and yet there's no acknowledgement of that. If the saga was an assortment of loosely connected stories, a unified intentionality could not be detected. With lack of intentionality came a lack of interest. So initially, it would appear that the room presents a completely opposite situation to that of the Osuniga saga, since, again, like we said, Tommy Wiseau was reportedly, at any rate, in charge of the entire process of transmission from film to script. In addition, as Wiseau also functions as the director and producer and actor, uh, he has, we have a unique access to his intentions. However, this does not take into account that the original intention is lost in the process of the textual and medial transmission and cinematic editing. The Room, therefore, the Room, therefore, like any other cinematic release, exhibits a gap between the original authorial intention and the intention that lies behind the final product. While the complex process of transmission that is involved in the production of a film is inherent to the medium, the gap between the intention and final product is exacer exacerbated by Wiseau's unique personality. In his work on the film, and despite his statements otherwise, Wiseau simply did not manage to communicate his intentions to the audience. So this is manifest in several interviews in which the director defines his film as a black comedy. So for those of you in the know, black comedy or dark humor requires irony as a key component, an irony that is either missing or not conveyed properly in the movie. The process of transmission and contrary statements provided by Wiseau creates a situation where the audience's belief that they can obtain the film's intention requires them to actually ignore what the filmmaker has to say about his own movie's intentions. Much like with Yosu Ninga Saga, I love, I love saying this sentence, much like with Yosu Ninga Saga, the process of the room's transmission, it's like connecting these two, it's, it's marvelous, uh, creates a uh, situation where characters and scenes seem superfluous and interpolated to the film's audience. Um, so I, I'm going to skip this statement because it's kind of uh, maybe superfluous. But um, basically, it, the same things that happen in Yosun Ninga Saga, the superfluity also happens in the room. Examples of this are found in abundance. One of the oddest characters in the film is Denny, who uh, Greg Sestero and Tom Bizzle describe as in their kind of autobiography of Greg Sestero a man-child peeping Tom neighbor who has no purpose in the story other than to ambiguously propose a threesome and be saved from a drug dealer. Denny's function within the plot is more significant than Sestero and Bizzell give him credit. His inclusion both attests to uh, Johnny's magnanimous nature and offers a softer side to Lisa, who is otherwise devilishly depicted in the film's narrative. So here is this scene. Hey, Johnny. Oh, hi, Danny. What's wrong with Mark? He's cranky today. <laughs> Girl trouble, I guess. 
What's new with you? Not much. Still going to the movie tonight? Oh, sure we are. What kind of movie are we going to see? Well, we'll see... Danny, don't play too much. It may not come out right. All right. Let's toss the ball around. Okay. Got to tell you about something. Shoot, Danny. It's about Lisa. Go on. She's beautiful. She looks great in a red dress. I think I'm in love with her. Go on. I, I know she doesn't like me because sometimes she's mean to me, but sometimes when I'm around her, I feel like I want to kiss her and tell her that I love her. I don't know. I'm just confused. Danny, don't worry about that. Lisa loves you too, as a person, as a human being, as a friend. You know, people don't have to say it. They can feel it. What do you mean? You can love someone deep inside your heart and there is nothing wrong with it. If a lot of people love each other, the world would be a better place to live. Lisa's your future wife. Danny, don't worry about it. You are part of our family. And we love you very much. And we'll help you anytime. And Lisa loves you too. As a friend. You are sort of like her son. You mean you're not upset with me? No, because I trust you and I trust Lisa. What about Elizabeth, huh? Well... I love her. Mm -hmm. When I graduate from college, get a good job, I want to marry her and have kids with her. That's the idea. You're right. Thanks for paying my tuition. You're very welcome, Danny. And keep in mind, if you have any problems, talk to me and I will help you. Okay. So uh, the awkward casting choice of 26-year-old Philip Haldeman as a teenage college student as well as having Denny proclaim his love towards Johnny's fiance, Lisa, and then quickly stating that he intends to marry his own girlfriend with whom he states that he is in love, creates an unsettling tension with regard to this character's integrity. This is enhanced by the unexplored drug abuse plotline that he is involved in, as well as an air of suspense that accompanies the character with no clear payoff. Another example can be found in, the, in one of the film's uh, most often quoted scenes where Lisa's mother, Claudette, mentions her daughter, uh, to her daughter her fear of death. And uh, yeah, for those who haven't seen it, I won't spoil it, so I'll just show it. Oh, okay. That was the end of a sex scene, by the way. So I'm organizing a party for John. Oh, sorry. Hey. Sorry. So I'm organizing a party for Johnny's birthday. Can you come? When is it? Next Friday at six. It's a surprise. Oh. I can bring someone if you want. Well, sure, I can come, but I don't know if I'll bring anybody. Oh, that jerk Harold. He wants me to give him a share of my house. That house belongs to me. He has no rights. I am not giving him a penny. Who does he think he is? He's your brother. He is always bugging me about my house. 15 years ago, we agreed that house belongs to me. Now the value of the house is going up and he's seeing dollar signs. Everything goes wrong at once. Nobody wants to help me and I'm dying. You're not dying, Mom. I got the results of the test back. I definitely have breast cancer. Look, don't worry about it. Everything will be fine. You're carrying lots of people every day. I'm sure I'll be all right. Oh, I heard Edward is talking about me. He is a hateful man. Yeah, I'm not going to show the entire scene, but just uh, the fact that she just, that Lisa just glances off the statement by saying, and quickly, of course, they divert the conversation back to all these like emotional uh, issues when she just said that she has breast cancer is uh, 
quite odd. The uh, brushing up of serious medical issues is made even worse by the fact that it is never again mentioned in the film. So um, there is one thing I want to say about this, which is, well, I'm going to jump in the gun here, so I won't say it, but uh, yeah, okay, okay. So this is another one of those uh, scenes where something very weird happens and unexplained, and this is very short, so I'll show this too. Hey, everybody, let's go inside and eat some cake. It's a good idea. I don't understand you, Lisa. You can say that again. Mm. Lisa looks hot tonight. So, uh, yeah, this comment of uh, just randomly saying Lisa looks hot tonight by this unnamed character who never appears is an example of the general tendency of the film to interject dialogue and scenes that are seemingly unrelated to the plot. These abrupt characters and scenes would have been more natural if the author had intended to create a feeling of confusion or of the uncanny for the audience, but not in a naturalistic melodrama. So much of these oddities are, uh, not, um, <laughs> are not present in what is touted as the room's original script from 2001. And as you can see, I have a copy of it dedicated to Yav and Mundi, Gudmund and Ricky. So I'm serious about my love for the room. Um, the exact nature of the script is unclear, but according to Wiseau, the film started out as a lengthy book, which uh, then uh, was transformed into a play and a movie script. A movie script that has been peddled by Greg Sestero and Tommy Wiseau in their public appearances is referred to as a play within the text itself. So the text, this one, you know, the director GS copy, um, Greg Sestero copy, um, this one is reportedly, um, it, it basically it says, not reportedly, when you open it up, it says this is a play. Um, so the truth about the transmission of the text therefore requires further research. But at present, it seems that original script is the agreed upon term when referring to this play. In this play, many of the unexplained elements of the film are not present. For instance, Denny does not appear there at all. And um, nor does uh, Bennett Dunn's unnamed character, the one who says Lisa looks hot tonight. The way that the cancer statement is treated is also noteworthy. The dialogue between Lisa and her mother, where the daughter dismisses the mother's ailment, is kept. But an additional dialogue appears later, after Lisa talks to her lover Mark on the phone while Johnny is in the toilet, in the shower, sorry. As Johnny leaves the shower, he hears her, fi her finish the conversation. He asks her, Johnny, who were you talking to? Lisa, my mother. Is she okay? Oh, she tested for breast cancer, and now she's talking about dying. It's not a big deal these days, is it? No, I'm not worried. Also, very interesting is that all the conversations between Lisa and her mom are on the phone rather than face to face. And a lot of the a lot of the weird moments of the dialogue, if you think about this as a phone conversation, makes a tiny bit more sense. If you imagine, oh, this conversation was on the phone rather than face to face, you understand it better. While this conversation does not add much, the, the conversation I just stated, it makes the original breast cancer scene a bit better knitted into the plot. Claudette's manipulative behavior throughout can be explained by the emotional distress that she is under uh, due to her breast cancer diagnosis. Like with other film productions and uh, the intra and intermedia transmission of the room then creates logical gaps that separate between what had been originally intended and the end result. While this is not the film's only flaws, it reflects a larger pattern of Wiseau's inability to transfer his cinematic vision to the screen in a manner that would seem coherent to an audience. Wiseau's insistence um, that everything in the final film was intended creates a cognitive dissonance for the audience, which urges them to act when viewing the film to actively participate in a way that reconciles the clear logical gaps. Similarly, Leos Vendinga Saga's editors and researchers have been convinced for centuries that the existing material does not operate as a unit logically. Therefore, they intervened in the form of editorial manipulation to reconcile the perceived gaps between an original authorial intent and the extent manuscript text. So actually there's like 10 more pages of this lecture, but I feel like this is a good point to stop because I think I made my point 
And uh, yes, so yeah. <laughs>